How many of you know that we serve a risen God? Yes. Hallelujah. He has risen from the grave. He defeated death. No other person on this earth, no other idol in this earth can say that they defeated death. He came to this earth, he was born, he lived, and he died. And he came up from the grave three days later and went back to glory to give us that opportunity to live with him in heaven. With his blood, we were cleansed. By his stripes, we were healed. And that's why we sing these songs of praises to his name. So if you love God and if you're just so faithful of him, reflect upon the things that he's done for you today and every day from now forward as we sing this song.
say this to you, and I'm, I'm off script, I haven't even opened up the manuscript yet, but I, we haven't met, but I'll bet you in your dreams at night, and in your waking moments, you probably see yourself preaching and leading hundreds to Christ. So I just want to affirm that to you today. That if you feel it in your spirit, don't hold back the anointing. You can never do better than doing what God has led you to do. So just keep doing what you're doing. Anymore. I would like to thank the New Life Church for being here today. Because when you heard that I was coming, you could have chosen to go someplace else. But thank you for being here today. Thank you to Elder Defoe for inviting me. And your uh, first elder, Elder Mark Brown, we go way back to Pine Forge Academy days. We have been like brothers and soulmates for more than 34 years. We don't talk often on the phone, but when we do, it's like we spoke yesterday. And when I am in need of spiritual conversation, consolation, or prayer, I know I can call my brother. And if, you know, when, before he retired, he was a real busy man. And if he didn't answer the phone when I called, I knew he would call me back. And he did. As busy as he was, he'd take a moment and pray with me. Now that he's retired, he's busy about the work of the Lord, for he too has an anointed call to be a leader in God's kingdom. To give him a word of that. Elder Defoe, a younger man than I, but someone told me years ago, if you really want to stay vibrant, Find young men to admire, and I admire your pastor. A man of God. He's humble. He's brilliant. He's committed. And he loves his wife and daughter today. Doesn't he just love you? Got to see the smile on her face. Just thinking about it. He asked me to come today and to continue the series that you all have been engaged in called All in the Family. He asked me to focus today on biblical principles for raising godly children. So I prayed about it and I started to go with this theme, train up a child. But you've heard that before. So God shifted my attention to another verse of scripture, which we will consider in a moment. But the title, if I title the sermon today, is Amber Alert. You might know that Amber Alerts are broadcast through radio, television, road signs, and all available technology. And they refer to it as an Amber Alert secondary distribution program. These broadcasts let law enforcement officials use the eyes and ears of the public to help quickly locate an abducted child. The U.S. Department of Justice coordinates the Amber Alert program on a national basis. You've probably seen those amber lights on the highway telling you to look for a certain car with the color of the car, the make of the car, the, the license plate, etc. Well, the Amber Alert program was named in honor of a nine-year-old girl named Amber Agerman, who was abducted while riding her bicycle in Arlington, Texas. She was later found murdered. Now, this program is used in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Amber Alert. There is a verse, a portion of scripture that speaks to us about an ancient Amber Alert. It is found in the second chapter of the book of Luke, 
verses 47 through 52. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles or on your electronic media to that portion of Scripture. Luke chapter 2, verses 47 through 52. When you get there, I'd like you to say amen and hold it up. I want you to hold it up because I have this tradition that I, God gave me years ago in studying Scripture. Before I study scripture or preach, I hold my Bible and I say these, these phrases. This is my Bible. In it I learn that Jesus loves me, Jesus died for me, and Jesus rose for me. This is my Bible. In it I learn that he's coming back for me so that we can live with him in a ceaseless, sinless eternity. Do you believe that? Yes. And hold your Bibles up and repeat it after me. You ready? Yes. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. In, it I learn In it I learn that Jesus loves me. That Jesus, loves me. Jesus, died me. Jesus died for me. And Jesus rose for me. Rose. This, is my Bible. this is my Bible. In it I learn, it I learn. that he's coming back for me so that we can live with him in a ceaseless, in a ceaseless sinless, sinless eternity. eternity. Now say amen and shake your Bible in the devil's face and let's pray. Thank you, dear God, for today. You've given us life. You've given us liberty. You've given us luxury. You've given us the knowledge of your incredible love for us reflected in nature, in love, and in Jesus Christ, your Son. Now, dear God, as we pause to hear your word after you've heard our praises, received our offerings, and just received our presence, bless us now with an epiphany of your presence. May each eye and heart that is here today Give a glimpse of your grace, your glory, and majesty. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin today with Luke chapter 2, verses 47 through 52. In the, which one is this? New King James Version, it says, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and saw him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they didn't understand the statement which he spoke to them. If I don't mention that, bring me back to that. Because there's a whole lot of white fire in that statement. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This little story outlines the purpose and the continuum of parenting. From birth through infancy, toddlerhood, childhood, and adolescence, parenting 
is pivotal. Say that with me, please. Parenting is pivotal. Say it again. I don't think you got it. Parenting is pivotal. Ladies and gentlemen, parenting is a lifetime role. It never ends because the power of parental prayers and influence continue even after death. I bet there's not a soul in here today who cannot remember the influence of a grandparent or a parent on you even after they have died. Therefore, good parenting must, it must, it must be intentional. Now, you might not have an intended the pregnancy. But once it's there, parenting must be intentional. When God directed, parenting develops the character of the parents as much as it shapes the character of the child. So, in these verses of scripture, we find that discipline, wisdom, stature, and favor are the metrics by which successful parenting is measured. Did you see that in the scripture? He increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Deborah and I, coming up on 33 years of marriage, were blessed with two children. Two, just two. I wanted a third or four. Those eyes, man. And she did that. She did exactly that. And she said, we can't do anything but duplicate one or the other, so uh, no. But we read. We read the Adventist Home and Child Guidance. Though compiled and first published in 1952 and 1954, these books are instruction in righteousness, and the instruction is timeless. Every Adventist couple should read these books. You ought to read it before you get married and again before the intentional conception or birth of each child. Get the books. And if you're young and you ever think you might want to get married, you need to get the book. Get the book. It's worth the time. It won't take you, it's a compilation, so it's a, a lot of little pieces that are put together. It doesn't take that long to read, but you'll find nuggets in there that will carry your family through, carry positive impacts of your family through multiple generations. Now, I know that many of you listening to me are not going to get the book and persevere through reading. And it does take perseverance because they are, they're, but anyway. I know you're not going to, some of you are not going to get the books, but I want you to know that failure to do so will in heaven at least prompt an amber alert because the lack of preparation for godly parenting leaves your child abducted by Satan. So it's that important. It's that real. You've got to prepare. You've got to be intentional about your parenting because if you do not you will leave your children vulnerable. And if your children get abducted into the claws of Satan, your grandchildren might be hellions. Take the risk, make the investment, do it today. This story in Luke chapter 2 talks about the Passover. The Passover in that year was April 15th. According to their custom, Joseph and Mary had traveled the 63.43 miles from Nazareth to Jerusalem. They traveled on foot with a group of pilgrims. No doubt they had a donkey or some other beast of burdens to carry their supplies because they were likely to be in Jerusalem for at least a week. Sometimes they'd stay a little longer for the Feast of Booth. But travel in that era was not unlike travel today. You know, you go on a trip these days and, and, and you see interesting things. When I was young, there was a certain kind of phrase, and we may take, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you drive along and you be in the car and you'd see uh, some pass you by 
and the men were in the front and the ladies were in the back. You remember that? And, and I used to think to myself, oh, we would never travel. My wife's place is up in the front seat. And we went on a trip last week. And it was that way. Me and the other man were in the front. And my wife and her and the other person were in the back. And that's how travel's been done for centuries. In this story, you get the picture that Joseph and the men were navigating the trail. Mary and the women were somewhere behind them. And the kids often were in between them, or as they got older, they might lag behind like children do. Or as they become adolescents, you remember when you were 16 and felt that your father or mother drove so slowly and you wanted to go ahead of them, but you kept your eye on where they were. Travel hasn't changed much, and it was that way then. They made it from Nazareth to Jerusalem together. They spent the time there as a family. They made the trip safely. The itinerary of the week was packed with ceremonies and worship events that culminated in the Seder meal. If you've never been to one, think about it, because the synagogues in this area welcome Gentiles to participate in some of their community seders. It helps with the theological perspective of what was going on in the ramp up to what we now celebrate as Easter. But then Easter was 20 years ahead. So they celebrated the Passover like they had done for centuries, rehearsing the delivery of Israel from Egypt. And it's important that knowing family history and cultural history is important because it helps to identify the future of a family. So young ladies and men, make sure your children know their ancestors. Tell them stories about your growing up and you might at some point want to stop keeping secrets because secrets are poison in family structure. But celebrate the history and the, the, the positive nature of your family experience because it plants within them a connection to their past. If there's no connection to the past, they will feel like it's all about them and life is about here and now. But when they know their history, they begin to feel like they are standing on someone's shoulders and like they have a responsibility to someone other than their friends. But there's more to say. So the Passover has happened. They had the Seder meal. They may have stayed around a day or two, but it was crowded in Jerusalem. So they loaded up the donkey like the Beverly Hillbillies pickup truck. And they started on their way back to Nazareth. Now Jesus was 12 years old. He was mobile. He was independent. He was self-differentiated in a number of ways. And in some ways even had been, I heard the word emancipated this morning. You used that word. So he could move about freely. So they load it up and they hit the road. The men in the front with the animals. The ladies coming on behind. And Joseph, being the man that he was, T having taught his son some independence, wasn't really worried about it. He figured, ah, he's probably with Mary, you know, Jesus will tend there anyway. But he's, you know, we know he's got, you know, he's got some muscle, but he loves his mother. He's special to her. He's probably with her. So they're marching along, and they get a day's journey away. Now, if the trip was 43 miles, how long would you suspect that a day's journey was? 12 to 15 miles. Half a marathon. Now, they moved slowly back then because they had the animals. 12 to 15 miles. And then they get to that appointed place, 
And Joseph comes to Mary and says, baby, what's for dinner? And she says, well, I got a little bit here and a little bit there. Where's Jesus? Tell him to get washed up. And Joseph said, where's well, Jesus? He's not with you? I thought he was with you. And Mary says, I thought he was with you. And just imagine how your family would be. You don't know where the boy is? He's your responsibility. And then you start getting all this, right? And you think maybe that didn't happen with Jesus' family. Maybe it didn't. But Jesus in your family, and it happens in yours, doesn't it? So, you know, we, we have this idea that some things are super perfect and that there were never any issues in the families in the Bible. Please. That's why God put the story in there. Where's the boy? Oh my goodness. So Joe, Mary says, go find my son. You ain't getting nothing to eat till you find my son. Joseph runs, grabs a date and runs out the house. Runs to the next. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? Says it went around. They went around to all the family members, all the community. Have you seen Jesus? My son disappeared one day. He was about four or five years old. The sun was setting in Berrien Springs, Michigan, and I could not find my son. Didn't know where, but we weren't keeping close tabs on him because it was Berrien Springs. He had a little, you know, and we looked all around. I started knocking on the neighbor's door over here, knocking on the neighbor's door, and he was sitting in their kitchen. <laughs> And, and But we'll get there. So we found him. And Joseph was doing that. And then the story says nobody knew where he was. So they went back a day's journey. So you've already walked 12 to 15 miles. But because you're worried about where your son is and nobody saw him leave Jerusalem, you're going to walk all the way back through the night. No rest. I, can you imagine Joseph saying, baby, I'm tired. I'll look for him in the morning. What would you say? I bet some of you would lace it with profanity. <laughs> Get up and go find my son. And she went with him. So they walked back through the night. The story says they when he was about. He was right with us. And we turned around and Jared was gone. I love my son. I'm just telling these stories because I love him. But it makes it real. He was gone. We couldn't find him. He was right there. And he was gone. We started looking around. Became even more frantic. I'm standing by the door daring somebody to walk out with my son. <laughs> so the police, call the police. My son is missing. And then all the clerks started looking around, and I'm walking around looking for Jared, and he peeks out from behind some pants and says, peek up <laughs> But we didn't whip him. We were so glad to see him. But three days, three days, so they looked everywhere, and finally, either the guidance of the Holy Spirit or somebody said, you must mean that little boy that's down in the temple confounding the priest. Mary said, I asked him. <laughs> asked him, go get your son. Because because Mary, that she couldn't go in there all the way. So Moses, uh, Moses, Joseph goes in and they see him there. And the priest and the rabbis, and I, I can imagine he said, Mary, he's in here. And she just broke all the customs and went right in. Jesus, where have you been? Why would you treat us like this? We've been looking for you for three days. What did you do this for? Now, now you know Mary knew the scripture. She knew the book of Isaiah. Joseph knew the scriptures. But in that moment, that three-day window just didn't click in their mind that three days was going to be important as he grew. They remonstrated with him and Jesus was like, why are you upset? Don't your kids do that? They get, they get on your last nerve. And then wonder why you're upset. 
My mother had a statement. She said, I have one nerve left, and you have rubbed it raw. Oh, boy, when she started that, everybody just got quiet. Because it would be violent if it wasn't. <laughs> so they find him. They remonstrate with him. And then come, say, come on home. Now, can you imagine Judge Judy? You know, Jewish mother and her son. Or uh, Dr. Laura and her son. Can you just see him taking Jesus by the ear and come on out of the sanctuary and let's go home? That's a little bit, you know, but it makes it real. And the Bible says Jesus submitted himself and went home with them. But the things that he had said, Mary pondered in her heart. She remembered in that occasion that an angel had come to her and said, this is going to be the deliverer. No doubt she saw twinges, tinges of that in his toddlerhood and in his growing adolescence. And she kept it in her heart that Jesus was going to do and be something great. They're hurt, they're angry, and they're wondering, what do we do with this boy? What do we do with this boy? 12 years old, he's as smart as the rabbis. What do we do? Brothers and sisters, the first guide to godly parenting is to ask God what his will is for your children. What is God's will and purpose for your children? And once he reveals it to you, it is your responsibility to guide, not drive, the child in that direction. Some of us feel like we're supposed to make our children be that that we want them to be. But have you talked to God about it? Have you talked to God about it? When I was pastoring in Philadelphia, Sabbath school superintendent at the time had a son. He was a handsome boy, young man, handsome young man, because he graduated from high school. He was the prince of the church. Every 13th Sabbath, if none of the other kids knew their 13 memory verses, he knew all of his. At seven years old, he could lead song service at a line because he knew all the songs. But as he grew older, and grew away, he grew away from the church. But his mother agonized with the Lord. She told me that God told her that her son was supposed to be a preacher and to lead lots of people to the Lord. But he became one of the major drug dealers in Southwest Philadelphia. Until one day, someone came in his apartment and shot him dead. She called me and she was devastated. Pastor God said my son was supposed to be a preacher. And God, and God. Oh, she was just distraught. As any mother would be. We did his funeral at the Ebenezer Church in Philadelphia. When I got there, the church was packed. Church members couldn't get in the church because people that this young man had interacted with filled the church. They were outside. And so I go up and this guy who was very obviously um, in the business said to me, you the pastor? I said, I am. You doing his eulogy? Me and my boys want to sit on the front. I said, why? Why would you want to do that? And he said, because he had something special. So I just, God put it in my, let him do it. So I asked the usher to let him sit on the phone. And then we got into the funeral. And I'm preaching about destiny. How God has a plan and a purpose for every life. 
God put it in my, wasn't in my notes. And I said to them, I said, this young man was supposed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. To set at liberty those who were captive and those who had been imprisoned by, by, by their own bad errors or by habits and substances never intended for them. And it was like something went over the audience. And in that moment I said he was supposed to be a preacher. And his dead, cold body is preaching to every one of you today that now is the time to make your calling and election sure so that you don't die in your sins. And God put it on me to make an altar call. Have you ever seen an altar call at a funeral? But I did. 300. 300 young people came down weeping and fell at the altar asking God to forgive them for their sins and straighten out their path. One of the young men who was on the front row started, he fell on his knees, he said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. I was shocked. That boy had word in him. God has a purpose for every one of our lives. God has a purpose in the lives of our children. It is the role and responsibility of parents to ask God to show you what their purpose is. And when he tells you, tell them. You don't have to beat it into them. Tell them and then pray about it. There's a verse in the Bible, Ephesians 6, 4, that says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. I got to tell you today, there are many ways that this can happen. Fathers can provoke their children to wrath by being stubborn themselves, by being abusive in the home, by ignoring your children or abandoning them. I did my dissertation. My, the title of my dissertation, you can look it up, you can get it, it's out there now, it's published, but it's going to be a book sometime next year, so don't buy that one because I'm getting money off of that one, wait till the book comes out. <laughs> the title is Hope and Purpose, the Antidote for Anger and Aimlessness Among Young People. And it is real that when children lose sight of hope or feel that they have no purpose, they then become angry, rebellious, recalcitrant, and obstinate. If you've got children, dads, you need to make sure your children know who you are. They need to know where you are. Because without knowing who you are, they will never know who they are. God says that a man who refuses to care for his family is worse than an infidel. If you're neglecting your children, even in the pursuit of good things, like a big house and a nice car, if you're neglecting your family, you're neglecting God's will. It causes an amber alert. Let me hasten on. I said earlier, discipline, Wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man are the keys to raising godly children. Please, please, please understand that discipline is not the same as punishment. Discipline is not the same as punishment. Discipline corrects and teaches. Punishment exacts pain as a penalty or payment for disappointment. Please get that. Punishment exacts pain as a penalty for disappointment. Discipline corrects and teaches. They're different. Discipline is an entire toolkit. Punishment is a tool. And you know that old saying, if your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail? <laughs> if all you know how to do is punish, then you're going to see every infraction as a disappointment as opposed to a teaching moment. Four quick thoughts on discipline. 
because children need discipline. They need to know the boundaries, and they need to know that there are consequences if you cross those boundaries, right? Amen. So four things about your discipline. Number one, it must be consistent. Your discipline must be consistent. Now, let's think about it this way. If you want your son to be healthy and vibrant and manly, but you are an obese, greedy, undisciplined person, what is your son going to think? If you want your son to be spiritual, and you want your son to know the word of God, but you don't, your son never sees you open the Bible, but sees you watch five hours of television every day. What do you think your son is going to think? Men, if you want your son to go to church, you got to go to church with him. Because there is a statistical study that shows that when a parent takes their child to church, 80% of those children become anchored to the church. When you send your child to church, only 7% feel anchored. You see, discipline is not, what you, not just what you expect from the child. It's what you model and demonstrate. So discipline doesn't start with the child behind. It starts with your character and personality. Discipline must be consistent. Number two, discipline must be calm. If your discipline is not consistent, your children will begin to see you and eventually call you a hypocrite. If your discipline is not calm, it becomes intimidating. And intimidating discipline creates bullies. How many of you like bullies? Nobody? Can you remember somebody who bullied you? Nobody? Thank you, two, three people, because I thought I might be the only one, but there was this kid named Raymond when I was in the fourth grade. Raymond was a bully, man, and, and, oof, but I beat him. <laughs> Freed up the whole class at that point. Um, uh, so calmness, 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 because you don't want your kid to be a nasty, mean girl. You don't want your son to be a bully. Therefore, you should not bully your children. Imagine you're two and a half feet tall, and somebody six feet tall is bellowing at you and grabbing you and slinging you all over the place. You're terrified as that two, two foot tall kid, but when you grow to be five feet tall, you're gonna start exacting some of that same behavior on smaller people. Hurt people, Hurt people. Teach people love through consistency and calmness. Number three, let your discipline be a correction. A correction. Counterbalance bad behavior by emphasizing the good. Someone told me years ago that the best math for correction is to add one criticism to two compliments. When you see your child moving in the wrong direction, compliment what you know to be good about them. They will listen to you more adequately at that point because you've gotten their attention. I have a two-year-old grandson, and I did have to spank him two weeks ago. Oh, my heart. But most of the time, I say, Brayden, come here, let me talk to you. You know, I really appreciate X, Y, or Z. I know you like to walk the dog. I know you like to play outside in the grass and climb the tree, but what you just did there, that's not a good thing. And if you keep doing it, then we're not going to let you walk the dog, or you won't, might not be able to climb the tree. He gets that. He says, I'm sorry, chaps, and he gives me a hug. Try it at home. You know what? Try it with your spouse. Two compliments before one criticism. So we've got consistency. Calmness and correction. How many times has God corrected you? Did he beat you down? Or was he loving and gentle? Forgiving and kind. 
So consistency, calm, correct. And the fourth one about this discipline thing is covenant. Covenant. Make a covenant of love with your children. Let them know that you care about them. Be proactive instead of reactive. Joseph and Mary in the Amber Alert were reacting. It was an emergency. In emergencies, you have to react. But you know what? There's a difference between a reaction and a response. A reaction is reflexive. You just do it because it's a reflex. You go to the doctor for your physical, and you've got on that, that cold blue robe, and you're sitting on the cold table, and the doctor comes in, and he hits your knee with that mallet, and you do like, that's a reflex. That's a reaction. But if you know what a reaction needs to be and you practice it, it then becomes a studied response. Don't be reactive to your kids. Practice adequate responses. How do you do that? You're proactive and you establish boundaries, expectations, and natural, logical consequences. Natural, logical consequences. I mentioned spanking Braden. That was a natural, logical consequence. Hit my daughter again. <laughs> I didn't say it, but you know, you got him. And so he, he needed some correction that was... But discipline is not the execution of pain to correct behavior. It is setting an expectation and giving guidance to reach success. Does that make sense? This is what Jesus does with us. He does that with us because he loves us. Now let me tell you something else. Switch to another thing. In antiquity, Jewish men, Jewish men were taught that they had a responsibility to the community, to history, and the future to teach their sons five things. We have that same thing today. Your children ought to know how to read, how to write, how to add and subtract, how to swim, and a trade. If a Jewish man did those things for his son, he guaranteed that his son would know how to provide for himself and subsequently for his family and generations to follow. Those were community cultural expectations. As Christian people, we ought to have a similar kind of expectation that our children can provide for themselves and for generations to follow them by giving them a good home environment. Someone said, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not a good idea to break the will of your children. God is not pleased when we oppress children. And oh, if I had the time, I would just say something about our attitude as a nation to all these children who are trying to find freedom and security. But we're not on that topic today. God wants us to set up positive environments in our home. I'm almost finished now. In fact, somebody can come up and start playing some music for me if you want. Four things. Nutrition. If you're a homemaker, a wife, a mother, a father, you ought to know something about nutrition. You ought to be able to put together a meal because the, a good meal at home builds the brain tissue, the muscle tissue, and the bone tissue of those children who are growing in your home. You give them Twinkies and ho hos and they'll wind up in jail. <laughs> Nutrition is important. And let me say this to you, that when you win and how you serve it up is just as important as the nutrients and the food. Every family ought to have a dinner table. Let me just stretch out a little further and suggest this. There are statistics that say that families who own their homes, 
children of parents who own their own homes do better in school, generally. And why is that? Because there's something about ownership that God planted within our spirit. When we own something, we treat it differently. And when we treat it differently, God values it even more because you value it. And in that sense, I don't know anybody who was able to buy a home without the help of God. So when you go into that house and you say, God gave us this, then you teach your child something you said today, God's all sufficiency. But when we are on our knees begging for the light bill, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, you got to go to God for what you need. But if you're always at that point, you're demonstrating to your children a spirit of insufficiency. God wants our children to know that he is God, that he provides, and that he provides for them through us. So that meal, breakfast, dinner, talk time around the table is a spiritual value. Nutrition, but not just for the body, nutrition for the environment. Children need nutrition in their spirit. And if your home is not filled with God's presence, it will be filled by the devils. Because nature abhors a vacuum. So if you're filling your home with God's presence, there might be some things you need to turn on, like good music, like wholesome radio. Now, I'm not opposed to laughing every now and then. I'm not opposed to, to being entertained. But please know that the caliber and character of the entertainment you invite into your house resonates in the environment. And so if your home is full, full of TV that's representing adultery and murder and all kinds of ungodly behavior, your children may not be able to comprehend it, but they will feel it in their spirit. Don't you know that song, every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I pray. Every time they feel a different spirit, it plants seeds of that in their soul. This is serious business. Serious business. So nutrition. Second thing you've got to cultivate in your home environment is joy. Joy. Everybody say joy. joy. Say it again. Joy. Say it again. Joy. One more time. Joy. You all don't sound like you're acquainted with joy. <laughs> Have you ever had joy in your life? Yes. A couple of you have. For those of you who haven't, I want to give you a mathematical equation so that you can have joy in your life. Are you interested? Yes. The people back, are y'all interested? Yes. Thank you. Because I'm going to give it to you anyway. Yeah? Joy. 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 Spell J-O-Y. I learned in algebra. Any math teachers in the house? There's one back there. Okay, help me if I get this wrong. But I learned in algebra, I wasn't too good, that letters can be substituted for numeric value. And I could not quite comprehend how x to the second power plus p could equal z. And, and it had to be explained to me over and over and over again. But I know how joy works. So now imagine that, let's see, you read from left to right, right? So on this side, put a capital J in your mind. J. You there? In the middle, put an O. And on the, the other side, put a Y. So you got J, O, and Y. Now if J is substituting for a value, and the O is substituting for a value, and the Y is substituting for a value, then we can figure this out, right? Yes. So if we put Jesus yes. for the J, and we put U for the Y, and we realize that zero has no value, so we move the O out of the way because it's not of any value, then you have 
the mathematical equation for joy. And that is let nothing come between Jesus and you. Let nothing come between Jesus and you. That's, that's the secret. That's the secret. Anything that comes between you and Jesus has to go. When you get there, you can have joy in your home. I learned a song when I was a kid. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. Your sins he'll wash away. Your night he'll turn to day. Your life he'll make it over anew. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. You know the other thing I learned in algebra? Was that when you have two whole numbers and there's no sign of operation between them, it means you multiply, right? Is that right? So when you've got nothing between Jesus and you, he multiplies your potential. <laughs> He'll multiply your purpose. He'll multiply the product of what he wants to do in your life. How do you get there? The third thing, prayer. Prayer. Prayer is super important when you're a parent. You've got to season the atmosphere in your home with prayer. You've got to learn how to pray boldly. I read in a book recently, The Circle Maker. Anybody read that book? If you haven't read the book, get the book. It's a good book about prayer. He said, bold prayer honors God and God honors bold prayer. Have you seen a bold prayer answer? I told you that when, when God is directing your parenting, it influences your character as well as the character of the child. When, when my kids were young, we didn't have a lot. And my car needed brakes. I'd done it before. This is a spring day, and I jacked up my car. It was a little red Toyota Celica. You remember that? The red Toyota Celica. Jacked it up, took all the wheels off. Each wheel had five lug nuts. And I had disc brakes on the front and brake shoes on the drum brakes on the back. So I'm working on my car, I'm getting those brakes done. And I'm just kind of in my own reverie because, you know, working on a car will make you pray. <laughs> Woo, it'll make you pray. Or cuss, I prefer to pray. <laughs> I'm telling the truth, y'all know it's true. Yeah, yeah, you, you know the Holy Spirit's with you when you're cranking on a bolt and you break it and you hit your knuckles on metal and you bleed, but you don't cuss. You know God's with you then, right? right? So I'm working on it. And it was good sanctuary time. And I noticed my son and his friend Nathan, they were out and they were throwing stuff. Turns out they were throwing my love nuts. <laughs> so when I get the brakes done, and I'm ready to put the wheels on the car. The lug nuts are gone. And I remembered they were throwing stuff. So like Joseph and Mary, I said, Jared! Yes, Daddy? Were you throwing my lug nuts? Yes, Daddy? You better find every one of them. You better pray that God helps you find every one of those lug nuts. Or I'm going to have a piece of your um, um, belt. And I, I looked around, and my son was kneeling on the porch with his friend. And I heard him say, dear Jesus, please help us find every one of daddy's love nuts so that we don't have to get them with it. Amen. And they got up, and within a few minutes, now do you know how tough that is in grass? They found all 20 of them. I hugged them. I said, thank you. Go in the house. And I knelt by the car. I said, thank you, God, for answering their prayers. Not because I didn't want to whoop them, but because I did not want them to be disappointed in you. My son taught me how to pray boldly. Pray boldly. There is nothing you need that God can't supply. The only times he won't supply your need is if you'll use it in opposition to his honor and glory. There's another kind of prayer, and that's prepositional prayer. 
You got to pray prepositionally. What is a preposition? It's a word that demonstrates a relationship between another word. And it demonstrates time and place. And that's why my wife hates it when you end a sentence with a preposition. Where the boy is at? She hates it. But God wants us to pray for our children. God wants us to pray with our children. God wants us to pray into our children. He wants us to pray about our children. He wants us to pray prepositionally about our families. Do you get that? Yes. So when you leave here today, don't just pray some weak, namby pamby memorized prayer. Get to the point where you can pray boldly and you can pray prepositionally. Some people don't value bold prayer. Ah, my family and I were traveling. We were traveling on a space A flight. If you've been in the military, you, you know about that. We were in California trying to get to Okinawa. And they had planes out on the runway, but they said there was no plane available for three days. At the end of the third day, after they told us there were no planes, I figured it's going to cost about $4,000 for me to get my family back to Okinawa. So I said, I said, I had a, a handkerchief here somewhere. I said to the people, can I make an announcement? And the lady said, sure. I said, ladies and gentlemen, some of you don't know me. I'm Chaplain Anderson from Okinawa. And I'm ready to go home. How about you? They said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, I believe in the power of prayer. So when they're finished here, let's gather in a circle back here. And let's pray that God will get us an airplane. We prayed in a circle. And we left there three hours later. Because God answers your prayers. So bold prayers are important. And we've got to begin to pray boldly. We've also got to pray agriculturally. Because every prayer is a seed. Every prayer is a seed. That you plant in your spirit by saying it. And in the mind and heart of God by asking for it. So when you pray specifically and boldly about your family, your husband, your wife, your child, that plants a seed in the divine intent. And God is the one who makes seeds grow. There was a story about an old prophet who was walking down the street. And he saw a man planting a tree, a carrot tree. And he said to the man, how long will it take for that tree to bear fruit? And the man said, mm, probably about 70 years. And so the prophet says to the old man, do you really think you're going to have another 70 years and you're going to eat that fruit? I like that stained glass shirt. You're going to eat that fruit? And he said, probably not. Well, then why are you doing it, the prophet said. And the man looked at the prophet and said, when I came into this earth, there were many trees that my father and grandfather planted. And I have eaten from those trees though all these years. I am not planting these trees for me, but for my children and my grandchildren. We got to plant prayer seeds. We've got to pray with intentionality and boldness. So I'm done. I'm finished. But I want to ask you this thing. If you don't want an Amber Alert in your life, you've got to put this, what you've heard today, to work. <clears throat> Chief among them, prayer. So I want to say a prayer as we close. And I want to pray for you and your family. If you've still got children at home, I want to pray for your parenting techniques. If you're a child and something I've said has struck root, struck a chord in your heart today, then I want you 
to demonstrate that you want joy. Nothing to come between Jesus and you. So, ladies and gentlemen, my appeal is simple. If you want God to anoint your parenting, I want you to come down here right now and receive this prayer. 